customers' data is very secure and have secure boot processes in order to you know show show a certificates of trust to the system. The SATA port is basically driven by the Southbridge. Uh, Intel went ahead and now is supporting 10 ports of SATA, 6 gig. We're plumbing each one of those ports out to our blade so we can support up to 10 devices, although today we only support eight, four hard drives and four SATA SSDs. And on our express slots, our right is used by 16. Frankly, we found that very parts are pretty needed for by 16 in the 25 watt category. We dropped that to three and instead put it by 16 uh, trade for a measuring card for extra we talked about networking with 40 gig. We're seeing more and more rig adoption in the ecosystem. We want to be prepared for that. And then we are fast connected from 6 gig capable to 12 gig. So here's a picture of the blade itself. This is actually a reference design. We have four different fires. They all look a little different. Yeah, you question? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm the wrong person to ask those questions. So. Um, so say so when we're done with the conversation, we come by and we can your card and all. I'll give my card. Get it figured out for you. All right, but for seven, not the room. So I'm going to talk about the play. Must be so we have four designs. They're all slightly different, but they think it is, they are all identical in the back. Talk to the back point messaging, and they're all identical in the front. They all have four hard drives. The placement of the drives are pretty much consistent. So I uh, only have 16 NIMS, two CPUs, pretty straightforward. Um, we actually have three um, uh, YMA connectors. The one on the bottom is our PCI Express by 16 connector that reaches our payback and messaging card. The one in the middle is our Ethernet connector for command stability signals. The one on the top is our optional SAS connector. The connector is always there for our you can You can choose not to use it for your deployment. It just carries the SAS signal. And you'll find up here, one point up on the left, these two connectors here are where the SAS cable would connect to from an HPA in the PCI Express spot. On the right, we have four M.2 risers. One of them also doubles up as a PCI Express connector, so it's a by eight or two by fours. When you have um, all four M.2 risers, the far left on the right does interfere with one of the disk drives. To be down to three disk drives. And then finally, we have a ambient sensor up front, which is actually not shown in this picture. An exhaust temperature sensor at the back, so we know that this server needs to be cooled for fan power. And we have a very light in the DMC, it's an ASB 10, 50, or 1250, very light light pollution, which provides the zero four responses to our. We have two hard drives connectors in the front, so it's two of the port drives. Um, it's going to be made into another board. And there's two pound out uh, connectors in the front of the board to make the board drive. The question is how does it, how is it a machine or a, 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 a FDG accelerator at this place? If you were to do one, which why the phone would be back to the card, it means a piece express, and it's roughly 20 times the size of our. Uh, so I've got a couple of slides on our, uh, our M.2 optimized flash. Uh, once again, it's about the same size as the dipstick, 100 millimeters long. We also support 80 millimeters and 60 millimeter sizes. If we look at the card on the bottom left, we'll see three holes. You basically put the M.2 module in there and you turn one that's really one of the three holes based on how long the induction module is. Our riser, the port one module on the left of the riser, and one module on the right of the riser. Each riser gets two, and then one or two, and two modules. 
and from a performance perspective, uh, significant character capacity is four times as much. But since we're each express connected versus a single six gauge static connected to the south wind, uh, we have much more bandwidth and more uh, performance. Uh, the, because these are running at around five, six months. So the power is really low. If you add eight of them together, it's going to be a very high aggregate performance. And lower will be here in about five thirty four eight presentation, going more detail on the FFG device. So yeah. Yeah, so the question is I'm running out of pizza express link. So the two process will offer eight way to express. We are actually using fifty six of them in this design. Uh, with uh, 56, 24 of those, which is 60, 32 of those go to MSC. And then we have the land resident and the uh, Quebec resident. So we actually have some of those in the exercise. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here this plane management and the same solution we have in our design design. Um, allows us to again, really to value possibility is we can have one data center managed software and have ways to be from Dell and DT. But from all the fun and we need other suppliers in who want to bring in the portfolio without changing or how we manage the system. Uh, a little bit on our networking side, as before, the specification we have for V1 supported for you, but we didn't have access to the output on the back of the back plane. We're still being plugged in right now. So we want to build a VNIC in that slot on the bottom left, and it works with the same We want to build a 40 VNIC. Put it in on the we're shown in the middle. The 40 gig main path is going to be back on. For us, we tend to be single port in our networking design, so we have to both. If you wanted to put dual pan in the uh, USFD to SFD turn converter, you can get dual pan at the box. And this is a picture of a mentioning card. We actually did add a little bit of extra heat out zone for the VC mentioning. We're seeing as we move forward in time, the big vendors of the have larger on the basics. We can find a little bit more that our supplier the time we're getting, and we're looking at that time for our V2. It's, you know, we have a few yeah, I mean, examples of this approved in the main of the show board. From a SAS perspective, with V1, you used to have a SAS messaging card. Uh, with V2, we are doing the red tape. The uh, SAT APA to be in one of the Camtech connectors um, to the uh, mini SAS HD connectors to that. Which is our important point to the mini SAS external HD connectors for that particular If you had a JBOD next to a compute server, you would cable that back at this computer facility, and then you could replace it to the five of the JBOD or the server to the head. And this is one example where the V1 data pod is still usable in a piece of capacity as a source. So, important to us is we actually deploy in a lot of places, and not all of them are not So, it's very important for us to have a full compliance of the EMC certification, EMI certification, UL certification, all of the local global. Uh, Geographical, we're going to put in a lot of the other components. We have gas and steels, or you might have seen it on our front back. If you look at the very back of the engine car, we have to have a gas on there to end properly. So, a huge saving uh, according to all of the requirements in this design. I know if you get the standard net, I lose a lot of the space. We do have micro data center, we also support co location. A few odd and ends. It's actually the same between E1 and E2. We have a few visible LEDs for the front and back of the way. Essentially, so it's basically a red, very easy way to get to the situation in service. And they put in play whether the power's on or off. They don't blink. So that's it. They say that when it's solid red, it's basically the way to get out for that. And then there's the one group that consists of all blades. And uh, it's boxed all the way up to actually ship their ways in the back. So the vast majority of our racks are, are built up as a spinning rear, whether they're 42 or 48 or 50 units tight, and they're drop shipped to a hit. Well, it's a good drive for the team. 
uh, this kind of quick picture of the build out. You know, uh, we had bare metal, we put in a baseline motherboard, and we had the component uh, that on it in price. A couple of meetings on the J mod has not been what we've published we post to be as I should be one. Uh, the reason we brought drove the depth of our capacity was just a pen drive and they have a white thread. So we have a pen drive in a very small amount of space, but there were an expansion for it. So you can support up to 84 hard drives or in the June note and then eight in chain daylight. That's actually what we tested we tested or we have a big case for it. It's optimal for density, 800 drives right, very large. And we saw the same line makes it those we have. It's all about what we have to place. We set that and it's much faster. This is a picture of what it looks like. There's actually a 20 lane mass expander. It was an L5 part. It's in the right back of the blade. Uh, Eight main of those connections lead straight back to the outside connectivity, and ten main of those connections and drive by the J line. And this is a six gigabit connection, uh, uh, a six gigabit expander. This is a six gigabit J line. The part of only for ten drive, we didn't even need it in full drive, full gigabit, or a plumb for the full gigabit. And then finally, the expander actually has a small process within it with a serial port circuit. We have a subset of our uh, IP9 can set that goes to the compute, goes to the plane. So we can do power off, power on, and all status. Oh, can you explain again what how do you think it's going to link something? Yeah, so if I look at the back of the JPOD, I'll see two um, four port big, big SAS connectors. Those go out to a server. So if you can't buy the server with to a 244.com connectors, a cable will go up. So I can run two, eight links of tasks between the server and the JBot. Or I can run eight links from the server to the JBot and maybe change another JBot to it. Four in and four out. And two in direct connected. You didn't have space for the more drive. Um, more pictures of the expander will be actually taking out a piece from the uh, J by specification. Uh, we do you know, so our design is with one expandable that it connects to drive and then two quad uh, drives uh, back one that actually are horizontal in the design. And you plug two right on the side so the cable that connects into there and you drive the quarter drive. Um, cable three packs and one other drive replacement. Our drive removal is very straightforward. Push a button on the side of the passing wall and let the drive out. This easy to service the time. So, to close here, uh, there's a few questions about five minutes after we have them. We have a very comprehensive contribution, both for D1 and D2. Everything having to do with the infrastructure, the, the trade back, the building cards, our distribution board, the chassis manager, the contributing burgers, and some massive. Everything that, and also for the software that's done on the test manager, we can use the source code on GitHub. Everything that goes into the blade, we can use the specification. So we have a full portfolio of that model and code. So, there are more. There are a few more presentations this afternoon. Uh, the next one is going to be talking about the D2 power supply with a period of battery. Starting with about five minutes. And then I heard we'll talk to you about more about the uh, end of shoot uh, as a time. I think there's a couple of executive sessions tomorrow. I think around 9 30. Okay. Uh, any other questions about the meeting? Okay, we'll do it in five minutes. We'll start the next session. Okay, one more question. Sorry. So I just like what how does the battery plus the port on wall memory and the spot? So I'll give a quick overview and then we can then uh to in more detail. We have the opportunity to use that battery for porting 
lot of things that are normally detected in server like a in, in the DIM module, an engine module, or a write pad on a test on a great card or parallel pad on that system. Not every deployment will have battery installed. So we don't want to install the battery in the data that already has them. Yes. Yeah. So we have to for both options for us. Sean Harris, um, Director of Engineering for the Mechanical Power Team for Microsoft Cloud uh, Service. Uh, today we'll be talking about introducing the uh, integrated battery power sponsors for support services. That's good. There we go. But before I do that, how many power engineers do we have in the room? I see one there. Two, three. Okay. Well, I'll adjust this accordingly. So, uh, believe it or not, Microsoft has been in the hardware business for more than a decade. By hardware, I mean data center. We've been building our data for more than 10 years now. We've been operating them. We design them, build them, uh, we construct them, we construct them, we operate them. We understand what goes on to our data center. This is a graph that shows you of where we've been and where we're going. And we're always looking to improve two things. DCO, trying to drop down costs, trying to drop up our power use. And this shows the trend conventional data centers, co ops, great floors. And we went off and did a density, we did uh, containerized data centers, 
the carbon income, and then we put the containment into our cohort, and then we finally got into modular data center. And when we did that, we so saw a significant improvement across the board. Uh, we adopted adiabatic cooling. Uh, I have a graphic that's going to come up in a second. We'll show you the value of that. By reducing or going to adiabatic cooling, we reduced annual water consumption from 150 million gallons to 7 million gallons. And water is a scarce commodity, it'll be done more so. But we thought that was the right thing to go do. We're also, by going to adiabatic cooling, we've also improved our current expenses by 30%. Now, the next thing on the table of the data center was the loss associated with the UPS. And that led to this system today. The OCS uh, server with local good energy storage. What we actually do is we introduce batteries into the power supply design. We see the reduced CO. Uh, we're able to occasionally go uh, deployment problems. We go into that in a few minutes. Uh, we have better offense, we have predictable performance, and we fail small. Guys, I prefer a conversation, so if you have a question, please jump in. Otherwise, I'll keep moving along. So this is a cartoon uh, looking at what a data center looks like. Uh, a water cooling part with an old design with crack over. And above that, we've got generators and UTS systems and the IT load. Um, we eliminated chill towers and the pumps and liquidated uh, that cooling, and that uh, so I'll make a significant improvement. When we remove the UPS, we're seeing a 5 x cost reduction equivalent. We're seeing another PDV improvement of 15%, and we're reducing the data center by 25%. I'll go into more detail. So when we talk about a traditional facility UPS, there's no one in here that does UPS for doing it. Okay, we'll look at that. So, Within a facility size centralized UPS, this is a multi megawatt application. And we have an AC to DC converter and a battery strength. We have an AC to AC converter. And we have power to the This is a huge uh, three we have small of a lead acid battery. Now, these are fun cell batteries. There's not the open thing here. Big buckets of lead. And then we have another one. Dedicated to house the equipment to convert the energy coming from the grid sitting out in the server. Uh, one time quotes uh, the cost of these UPSs would be about $10 a watt. Okay, $10 a watt. That's not what we see, but that's what I'm trying to And we know this to be true. We have experience with this because we had to deploy this in our free data center shown in the right hand corner. Now, we go on to the next one. We, talk, we can talk about uh, AC to DC or common bus AC systems. And we have deployed these systems. We deployed it in our containerized containers, our multiple days. Uh, essentially, you use a standard power supply and you put a, a, a battery backup in, in parallel to it. So you've got a battery charger, a lithium ion battery, typically an isolated transformer and DC output. The key here is that. This 12 volt bus is a tightly regulated bus, plus or minus 5%. And it doesn't matter if it's 48 volts or not, but the cost is driven by adding all of this extra circuitry to the design. And as current goes up, the cost goes up. So, this is what we've done. And yes, I can talk about this all the time. We are reusing existing circuitry for a that is found inside every power supply and every server. Every server has a power pack controller, has a, a DSP controller or a module controller for the overall design, has a DC to DC output. What we did, we introduced lithium ion batteries into the bulk food shed. Now we have a low current charger, we charge the battery slowly, and we have a relatively low current discharge path. Now we put 12 or 48 for that for a connector amount of power. It's and what was it, 130 amps? Is that right? 130 amps for 5 amps. So the cost of this output is much, much lower. So this is a streamlined component. Also, lithium ion battery. Lithium ion battery is now enhanced with convertible energy that much. So, any questions so far? We're going a little bit quick. A lot of time. All right. 
So this is what the unit looks like. Uh, the, the attributes are we provide 35 seconds of walking or a drive through plus 10 seconds of walking. Walking is important. That's some slides uh, talking about that in a few minutes. Up to six years walking. So if you want to put your server in this one and use it for six years, you could move it on. We have a flight operating function because we use change of that boom. Uh, we do back to back allergies with a 20 minute recharge. Uh, we only have a 2% average of the day. Also, we need a less than we need to start with the time. And you compare that number with a building unit, a recharge of 8%, you see a big improvement. Uh, we can deal with uh, single phase models. So, in the facility, if you lose a phase in the distribution, your system will naturally try to load the other two phases with the full power of your server. Well, that will be, that will ripple up into the left of the distribution of this. You run a high risk if you break it. What we do is you see a single phase loss, you go with battery on all power spots. So you run all of all three phases until the power is uh, We have a built in battery test, we monitor each cell health, uh, voltage, discharge period. All of that is available through our chassis. Uh, easy to do. Can you imagine using water by that the battery? Can you imagine changing the battery in your car? How, how difficult that is and how long that takes. This is a hot spot on the design. It just takes seconds. So the impact of that is uh, it reduced the mean time to repair, and we have predictable performance. Okay. Cost. This is a a big chart here. So the blue line represents centralized UPS system. We have a lot of different with experience and a contact from corporate. But you will buy a centralized UPS system a year before you commission the facility. But the budget cut a PO for that equipment for the room that's waiting for service. And then it takes another year to populate that service or populate that. So it's almost two years before you fully utilize the uh, We have a in every three times a maintenance of batteries. Batteries are important. We have an ever increasing line. The AC and the DC power bus, you can see how it steps up right off the top of the chart. So when we do a comparison of where we are with this product, you know, we see a 5x cost savings just to get it in the game, and it's about the same magnitude after. So it's a significant process. There's no way to go on that. Uh, did you know that we're talking about building the 12th fall size? A battery room, the UPS room takes up three foot tall. But with this design, you no longer need that. So for existing sites, maybe you can repurpose the food or something else, storage, work areas, whatever. And but for new builds, you wouldn't have to build that out. So you avoid having to lay the concrete, the wall, the electrical, the roof, and all that. And if you look at the up uptime uh, up on the roof, equating 150,000 square feet, 30 is the most possible for the new day. Dead silence. OK. Let's talk about efficiency and PUE. I know this is a little complicated. Yes, I have a question. Yes. So the question is, do super caps prevent a viable solution for that? Yes. Um, the problem with super caps, um, they were both as tolerant. That presents a problem. Uh, Costly for major barrier. I do think that in the future where we want to take a hybrid system, but right now, uh, super cash is really not uh, Okay, so on the right hand side or left hand side of the graph, we have a block diagram of every loss algorithm within the data center. And on the right hand side, I have a, a tabular form of that data center. And then with the last construction on the right hand side of that. Now, the biggest elements are the UPS losses, the battery recharge, and UPS 
pass it to Risa. Risa is where you have multiple units of parallel, you have to you have to degrade the one, but the more units of parallel you have. Yes. One more question. One more question. Honestly, at this point, I haven't come across a system that needed it. I just, I think the product will mature, and that there may be innovation that's coming that I don't see at this point. But the fact is, you can charge it. I've seen super caps uh, loaded in my like, a couple of pool cups. I've seen super caps on the front of So the niche marker they want, the voltage needs to go up, the cost needs to go down, and the cost needs to go So, uh, you look at this graph, uh, you can compare centralized systems and open GPS systems, and uh, our, uh, our capacity reset, when we put it in there for our less power supplies, this is an effective 99.9 efficient unit because it only takes little while to manage the battery pack, manage the car, and we're reheating the circuitry that's already embedded in the battery. So low cost, low path, low cost analysis. So if you go through this, you compare the units at the end. Centralized units consumes another 130 kilowatts, 29 kilowatts. If you just send a 300 watt blade, you get 428 more blades inside the system than you would with the traditional system. And so for performance per watt, this is a big hitter. Question for this slide. Uh, performance. Um, how many of you have played with large two cylinder? Uh, big and nasty. Big and nasty in those hands. Uh, the alternator has a high people's output stage. And so a lot below the output stage, you see a voltage. voltage and that true thing. Typically, a data center will stagger the section of the data center on one by one, so they gradually wrote gradually wrote the data center. Uh, we did some experiments with capital, and on the left hand side you can see a 100 percent block over the output voltage grew almost 30 percent of the 100 block The graph on the right shows an actual production unit in which the vendor that was buying the equipment that's still up on the recipe for the staggering of the load from the generator. And you can see that uh, AC goes away, AC comes back, all the compromise go from uh, battery on the AC cord, 100% of the load, the voltage starts to do it, it off of voltage, the back on battery, it's just up there and the motor works back, not good performance. And this is an example of not having good predictable performance. We have the techniques and the components in place of one of the power supply, the controller, what we have here. Inside the power supply, at the power cord, that C13 connection with the power supply, we mandate performance of walking on that point. So on the left hand side, you've got a single power cord, 1600 watt load, AC voltage return, we see a nice linear walking. Perfect. Exactly what we want. And on the right hand side, we have a multi megawatt point in place right now. We were going to commission, and this is a 650 watt level of that. Um, we walk the ground. Right here, you can see some jagged lines. Right? That is the downstream PDUs, downstream transformers, um, charging the core, typically doing the distribution. If this is the system coming back online, it is a nice. At well, we have currently, and we have zero associated with that. So it's exactly what we want. But we have mandated this for every product 
comes into our facility. So we always have predictable performance. It doesn't. Just some software. Hey, John. Yeah. Why not just have your close supplies set them up? We've got thousands and thousands of parts. You have to just set a range of seats. I don't think anything. I don't think that will work. I think that guarantees the corner. You will still have a case where you may get a joint person quiet. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's 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 right. Yeah, so why not do it at the government control of the credit for the system here for some time? It's one other thing that this audio battery is after the debt is going to charge more than the RAM is that some batteries is discharged more than others and having a whole different set of things. So you'll be shortly flat as the battery. So these are just some of the, the summary things that we get on this. Uh, cost reduction, talked about that. Power use to protect these people, talked about that. How we get there, reuse of surgery, and uh, really a simple design. design we, we reduce components from the design to improve uh, reliability. Um, we can a hot swap of the any time of repairs and things. Both of those elements improve the overall availability of the surgery. Uh, it offers a pay as you go along. I talked about that for a second. Um, it's two years fully utilized with a UPS. But you can use UPS exactly where you put it on. Exactly where uh, We have a unified UPS strategy with predictable performance across the state. And uh, this is, I think, the most exciting part. This goes back to the question of giving the market. How do you do it in the What's going on? By having a tightly coupled battery power supply and server, you have incredibly low latency. We're going to be able to do things that we've never been able to do. Before. Never before thought we could with a centralized or even a rack. And we're just beginning to go down that path. There's power packing, there's peak, peak shaving, charge, uh, cross charging, MV RAM, uh, work through the whole list of things we're working on. Uh, I'm very excited about it. So, if you need any questions about lithium ion batteries, non batteries, or uh, a topic that concerns the individuals who catch them on fire, um, you can have selected the same battery that you find in the pack. A handheld power tool is one. And it is not enough to announce that it's the same battery that you can get. It's an 1860 lithium ion cell. It goes through the UL, the UL testing, the United Nations testing profile. Believe me, they abuse these cells. They beat it up, hold it over, they squish it. Um, they do crash tests, uh, vibration tests, they heat it up, they have temperature cycle, low pressure, so it can be fun in aircraft, all these things. And how many of you have a lithium ion power tool at home? A bunch of you, right? How many of you have a top no. We've really not seen any serious problem um, in this space. So for that reason, we were willing to go down the lithium ion path. Uh, a little bit more on the uh, protection that you get to the lithium ion uh, battery. In our system, we have effectively eight layers of protection. Okay, within the cell, there are three layers of protection. The first one is we have a, uh, a positive power expansion and a current corrupted box. So if this thing starts to heat up, the positive coefficient changes, very the corrupted box opens up, and it should stop current at that point. Now if you have a manufacturing flaw within the cell and you have a short circuit that the CID does not take care of, they have what's called a uh, not a, it's not exactly a polymer, it's actually under the EA. Uh, but the material between the electrode and the uh, positive negative electrode actually as it heats up, the resistance goes up. So as you get to a runaway situation, really the maximum current, maximum current. But everything 
it does fail. And when it does, we have to take care of it. Uh, within each cell, uh, each cell has a dedicated fuse. So if a cell does have to come away away, then that fuse will open up. Uh, the second thing you have to worry about is expansion. Remember, if you're playing with lithium ion cells who are really disturbing, they slow up. We have accounted for that mechanical reason by physically spacing the cells in front. So if you, if you short out the cell and it swells to the front of the bone, it does not come in contact with the adjacent cell. So we don't have a mechanical problem today. Uh, another thing you have to continue with is the gas, poisonous gas, which are the lithium ion cells. We, inside our plastic case, we have uh, uh, we have a, a closed chamber, so as the cell vents, that gas is contained within that box. So we would not push that gas out into the patient. So th these are all the, the uh, protections that go into the package itself. Uh, we also limit the maximum amount of current that can go into the cell. So we charge the cells well below the maximum allowable voltage. And we also limit the amount of discharge from the cell. In our circuit design, no single point of failure could cause a battery pack to have a full load of charge. But things do happen, things do run away, things do catch fire, and when you do, we have multiple levels of email changing in our system. The, the power supply acts as the first shield, the chassis, the home code holds it. Access the factory field, and then to get to the next set of lithium ion batteries, you have to go through the next set of sheet metal technology. So that's the presentation that I've got. Are there any questions? Yes. Do you run the networking on the Networking is not part of the today. We are working on that. By now, you would be required to add a the appropriate UPS is by G2 command and all the Yes, that question. Yes. That's it. Come on. So our battery pack module has a capacity of 1,600 volts. We have 16, 16, 650 uh, cells in the foundation. There's two strings of eight in the So when you, have, when you have three phases and you lose one, you don't want to increase the load of the remaining two. So you pull the entire system off and put it on batteries so the fault is clear to the And then take a few minutes on the fault. So it's really not for right through a system, it's for protection of the facility.
No, when, when, we, when we go in, we could not find a standard other than what we go. So we went off to the manner of manufacturing. We didn't ask them uh, in five minutes. How quickly could we do it? Right? So that's how we approach the at each moment in the That's how we have
I know we're staying at the tent. Yeah, thanks for sticking around for us. Thanks for sticking around. I'm here to talk about our cloud storage for our servers. Um, and uh, my name is Mark Hallfield, and I'm uh, technical lead on our SSC project. Um, so, some of these things might seem very familiar to having worked with that itself. But they're the ones that often come up for. We really like fast storage, but not at the detriment of okay. the cost. So we don't want to put in a giant easy thing. We also want to be able to design one piece of hardware and put it into a lot of different applications. A lot of them can be a ton of scale. And we have a wide variety of applications. So not everyone's going to need to care about We want to have a pair of Considering all of these themes, we found that M.2 is the best form that's suited for all of these. So you might be wondering, what is M.2? A lot of people ask me, what is this? So first we'll go into M.2 background. And then I'll go into the advantages that are intrinsic in M.2 already. And then finally we'll wrap things up by specific requirements that we have to address these M.2 before the past. So, well, it's a, there's a specification and it contains a huge variety of things. The interface is um, not just for SSDs, there's specific things for wireless, like there's a video card. And the interface can also be data, it could be data, it could be QR, but in the case of SSDs, they're typically SATA or PCIe. And it's a very small form factor, so it's very well suited to mobile applications like tablet and Now, this is what I'm not too far in general, but what are they to do on cloud servers? For us, we'd like to be guys fast, fast, and it connects to our networks. Ideally, it's step 3 by 4 that slows also out The protocol could be either a sky or And we'll get into some of those things. In mechanical, uh, typically there are 110 points that we can support. This is what an end dot looks like. Well, often I call it like a sticky gum. So here I'm picturing the next to a piece of gum. Um, this is the 22110 form factor, which refers to the length of 22 millimeters wide and more than 10 And this one is the same. If you come by our booth, uh, <laughs> you're all supposed to have traits. You're a little lucky right <laughs> So this is, this is basically what an MDOT2 module is. Uh, what does it look like in the server? Well, here we've got our same MDOT2 module. First, plug it into an MDOT2 riser bar. It takes uh, about 200 size. This is where we support uh, any of the lights. We can pass it down. Here at 110, we'll move that faster to the border lengths. And then we have four spots that we can plug the size of it. So we can have up to eight and up. Uh, 
Typically, I see separate hardware. Actually, I, I have seen in the location brief. Yeah. Yeah, there were some different pieces. 
study. Um, and we'll get into each of those later on. Typically, they're just uh, modifications to firmware and small to long. So here's a breakdown of the different form factors. We can get PCIe and NVMe and all the different form factors. And here are some typical numbers. M.2, we measure um, from our hardware, and then we have the typical as well. So first, uh, you can notice the capacity. So we go for 70% of the provisioning. We can always have our applications create a uh, smaller Partition size, we realize the benefits of provisioning. But typically, the, the two and a half inch large cards are designed over 20 years. Another difference here um, the M.2, comparing the two and a half inch drive and the large card, um, the large card has no cabling. Uh, but it's also a very large part of the We can also look at the power. And um, looking at the system level, if we take four packet drives, and there's about 25 watts, versus eight and about two, they have about eight watts, then per blade, they have a much smaller power. And then the last piece here, for the performance, we can look at performance per gigabyte and see that it's about the same. Um, we double, basically double on the performance of the m and it's about what you would know to the average uh, power. But then if you compare to the power, then we're getting much better performance. We also like that M.2 is very, as I mentioned, power is much lower. Um, it's also a very young thing to pack as much as you can on the very small uh, circuit board. And then you can scale this up um, for your application. You only need a terabyte, you only need paper, a terabyte, and you need to get power. Uh, Whereas actually, more, scale it up. That's the cost power. And then you can also take this, this uh, M.2 element and design, or you can just buy off the shelf into the adapter <coughs> to get to the point of the of life. So there are four factors, or there are adapters that you can plug in and in and get you a large compact PCIe card. You can also design your own expander cards, uh, for example, for us and the other apps. Yeah. Um, <coughs> right, so if you just do the compute blade like this, then you can get eight terabytes. But you can also have a standard parts. Uh -huh. um, have and you can even it even go beyond that really in this other space. Basically, it's a nice element. You can look it out. We also like the thermal characteristics of that. So, comparing to a two and a half inch drive, then uh, if, if you come by the booth, then it's very easy to see in the blade. If you have a two and a half inch drive, you have to put it up front. It blocks with the air pump. And you have more flash density than you have not to, but you get. Uh, we get much better airflow to your CPUs and your mobile blade. So that's, those are the intrinsic advantages that are not true. Now we can get into what we have to modify about the effect to make it work really well. So one thing that often comes up, we have applications, people who don't notice this piece very well, and maybe they go buying off the shelf client drive. They always say, I don't need more here anymore. And this is the problem with the project. Basically, those client drives are designed for more than right? Your laptop is asleep when you are. 
and then you kind of wake up, start doing your email, maybe start doing technical work, and you have your work on it, and go off. You basically get a few tips in your activity. And the client firmware is designed to wait and do its garbage collection until it's time. And this is great, because you can go as fast as you can um, in this first quarter. But if you then take the firmware and do a client in your data center, ideally there, if you're, if you're really uh, doing your best for your application, you're going to be using your time constant on mass, mass. And if you do that with the client firmware, then every once in a while they say, okay, I really got a garbage can, really a can. And so you get these massive dips in the car, which isn't great. So basically all you want to do here, reduce your performance overall on do your garbage collection on top. And this is just a, a change. So your M.2 Vader is going to drive with the same hardware design. So in, in these in these devices, and it's it's a self-contained it's just a drive. Okay, so that was our first change for the cloud. The next change is for engineering. So your client application, you don't write very often. So you need to be But for us we have basically two classes of groups. Drive right to the day has been so we have a low cost application where they don't want to spend much money. They don't have to write them very often. About half a drive right to pay for it. And then uh, that maps over to about three k per memory cycle, which isn't as expensive as a higher cost option, which requires three drive rights per day every three years. And that translates to about fifteen thousand per memory cycle, which is now, if we look at our M.2, these different NANs are compatible, so you don't have to change your board. You can just figure in your ensemble and copy it the board. So each NAN that you have uh, requires a different qualification. Um, so you have to send it through a separate process and have to That's fairly straightforward. So the next thing is about protecting your data. SSDs like to cache. So, for example, your application is writing small IO. want to write it quickly, so you're going to cache it on the DRAM. And then once you collect enough of it, you'll have to get your demand to get your back. Now, that's typical operation when you have a consistent power. Sometimes the power fails, and your application is prepared for that. So, we have a couple of options. The first one, is to use the battery in the seal. So uh, when the system recognizes the power is going down, it sends a PCI reset. <laughs> the firmware takes it and takes it as a signal to spin all the data. Now this is, uh, the firmware has to recognize that signal. So there's a small firmware change there. But the nice thing is that you can use client hardware. You don't need any other circuitry to recognize that it's valid. You don't need physical masters to hold up the power to find out the data. So this is this is a nice option where you can take off the shelf client hardware. But you don't always have the NTSU battery on your own. So no system would be that option for you. And in this scenario, we need to hold up the master as well. In this scenario, the power failure is speed kind of data. And you use extra circuitry. So in the design, you need extra circuitry. And but the nice thing here is if the M.2 computer goes ahead to attack both of these, uh, both of these areas, they can design for detail scenario with the in the circuitry. But they can also sell a client with one very circuit by populating after having Alright, so this is kind of the last uh, Jelly bag um, changes for our inductions. We have lower retention requirements 
we're not going to be powered off for a very long time. So instead of the typical three months in here for uh, SSDs, we can go down to two weeks later. And this, the M.2 vendors can do this in help increase demand endurance uh, for lower cost, or they can reduce the refresh rate and cut down on the amount of price that the ground does. The other piece is we have a relaxation in the top side height on the MDOT tube. We've got the rising bar here. The capacitor is super detailed, being quite small. And in the server, we have a little bit more space than we have in a thin laptop. So we, we go and relax that. The PCI SIG has about two five millimeters here, but we can go up to three millimeters. All right. I think, yep, that's my last slide. So we saw what M.2s were, we saw the advantages in using M.2s, we didn't get the economy of scale, um, we saw the other end being informed factors, why the modular things were good, on scale, so we wanted different applications. And then we went through some other types of requirements, exactly what we had to do to change the firmware and the hardware to make it out. So thanks for sticking around and listening. And So we still leverage the economy of scale of the, the circuit board design. We do have to pay more than the time space for that iron. Basically, you break down the cost and say, I'll pay more for the van, but I'm not going to pay more for uh, the mass. Good
said Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye